Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to First Christian Congregational Church, United Church of Christ in Swansea, Massachusetts. And whether you're right here in the sanctuary or at home, you are warmly welcomed so that we can be together and worship God and celebrate all that is good together. And so I wanted to make a few announcements that we do have large print bulletins. If anyone needs one, you can see a deacon for that. I also am thrilled to see so many name tags out there and would encourage you to please continue to wear your name tags so that it helps me, it will help your future settled pastor, and it helps each other as we um, sometimes just forget. So please wear your name tags. If you need one, you can see any deacon and they can put you on the list for a permanent one that will show up next week like magic. I also would invite you to check out the search um, profile creation flowchart, which is right around the corner when you exit, just to see where we're heading as we put together um, our profile in the next step in our search process. So take a look at that. Finally, one more announcement. Uh, actually, a couple more announcements, true. Next week is July 4th. Yes, we will be here. Yes, we will be worshiping. And yes, we will have food. So, and the kids loving fun outside. All right, so, <laughs> so all awesome things. So I will be here and be so glad to celebrate the day with all of you. With that in mind, and then that we know that it's a bit warm, at least I'm a bit warm, uh, the deacons have a question for all of you. And so this is the question to think about, mull it over during worship and talk to your deacons as you exit. Would this congregation be interested in moving worship one hour earlier for the two summer months? You don't have to answer now, but for some of us, the heat is an issue. For some of us, we like to go do fun things after worship. Um, so just think about that and talk to your deacons. I'll remind you at the end of the service. All right, there's no right or wrong answer. We're congregational. We talk about all this stuff all together and make decisions together. I love the UCC. All right, so having said that, let us come together and worship. We are gonna stay in our pews to pass the peace, but there are lots of enthusiastic ways you can do that. And so let me say to you, peace be with you. And also with you. Let us begin worship together. So I invite all who are willing and able to rise for our call to worship, which is printed in your bulletin. O oh, faithful God, you yearn to be so close to us that we can know you in every breath, in every hope, in every relationship. You long for us to trust in your power, to bring to life new possibilities where there has been no hope. Meet us here today. Teach us to recognize the ways of life and hope into which you are leading us. So may our desires become your desires, our work become your work, and our community the place where you are sought and found. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our first hymn is, O Christ the Healer We Have Come, it is on page six.
this morning into our responsive prayer of confession and assurance. God, hear our prayers of confession when we resist your call to open our hearts to allow the freshness of your grace to enter. God, have mercy. When we close our eyes to your new and unexpected possibilities of healing and reconciliation, Christ, have mercy. When we let fear overwhelm us and cling to the security of what we know, instead of risking new steps toward your freedom and justice, God, have mercy. And yet, we believe God's mercies are fresh every morning. Christ offers forgiving grace. We are welcomed into a community of trust, abundance, and hope. And we welcome others to travel this road with us. Amen. This morning, we are going to move our children's time up. So we're going to do our children's sermon next. So I would invite all children, youth, people feeling young at heart to come forward. Yeah, I'm 
Can you hear me now? Okay. The first reading is from Hebrews of chapter 11, verses 1 through 3 and 8 through 16. The fundamental fact of existence is that this trust in God, this faith, is the firm foundation under everything that makes life worth living. It's our handle on what we can't see. The act of faith is what distinguished our ancestors, set them above the crowd. By faith, we see the world called into existence by God's word, what we see created by what we don't see. <clears throat> by an act of faith, Abraham said yes to God's call to travel to an unknown place that would become his home. When he left, he had no idea where he was going. By an act of faith, he lived in the country promised him, lived as a stranger camping in tents. Isaac and Jacob did the same, living under the same promise. Abraham did it by keeping his eye on an unseen city with real eternal foundations the city designed and built by God. By faith, Sarah was able to become pregnant, old woman as she was at the time, because she believed the one who made a promise would do what he said. Each one of these people of faith died, not yet having in hand what was promised, but still believing. How did they do it? They saw it way off in the distance, waved their greeting, and accepted the fact that they were transients in this world. People who live this way make it plain that they are looking for their true home. If they were homesick for the old country, they could have gone back any time they wanted, but they were after a far better country than that, heaven country. You can see why God is so proud of them and has a city waiting for them. The gospel, reading, the gospel reading is Mark chapter 5, verses 21 through 43. After Jesus crossed over by boat, a large crowd met him at the seaside. One of the meeting place leaders named Jairus came. When he saw Jesus, he fell to his knees beside himself as he begged, My dear daughter is at death's door. Come and lay hands on her so she will get well and live. Jesus went with him, the whole crowd tagging along, pushing and jostling him. A woman who had suffered a condition of hemorrhaging for 12 years, a long succession of physicians had treated her and treated her badly, taking all her money and leaving her worse off than before, had heard about Jesus. She slipped in from behind and touched his robe. She was thinking to herself, if I can put a finger on this robe, I can get well. 
The moment she did it, the flow of blood dried up. She could feel the change and knew her plague was over and done with. At the same moment, Jesus felt energy discharging from him. He turned around to the crowd and asked, who touched my robe? His disciples said, what are you talking about? With this crowd pushing and jostling you, you're asking who touched me? Dozens have touched you. But he went on asking, looking around to see who had done it. The woman knowing what had happened, knowing she was the one, stepped up in fear and trembling, knelt before him and gave him the whole story. Jesus said to her, daughter, you took a risk of faith and now you're healed and whole. Live well, live blessed, be healed of your plague. While he was still talking, some people came from the leader's house and told him, your daughter is dead. Why bother the teacher anymore? Jesus overheard what they were talking about and said to the leader, don't listen to them, just trust me. He permitted no one to go in with him except Peter, James, and John. They entered the leader's house and pushed their way through the gossips looking for a story and neighbors bringing in casseroles. Jesus was abrupt. Why all this busybody grief and gossip? The child isn't dead, she's sleeping. Provoked to sarcasm, they told him he didn't know what he was talking about. But when he had sent them all out, he took the child's father and mother along with his companions and entered the child's room. He clasped the girl's hand and said, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. At that, she was up and walking around. This girl was 12 years of age. They, of course, were all beside themselves with joy. He gave them strict orders that no one was to know what had taken place in that room. Then he said, give her something to eat. He sends the reading. Will you pray with me? O oh God, grant us faith that we might risk for you and the coming about of your kingdom. Amen. So I ask you, what are we willing to risk? What are you, what am I, what are we together willing to risk. That's what today's scripture is all about, risk. Two people are desperate for Jesus' healing. One man is in leadership with very high status. He's wealthy. He has servants and a family. His kids even get their own room. His name's Jarius. One is a poor woman who has lost absolutely everything. She would be shunned as any woman with a bleeding disorder would be. She is destitute. She is nameless. And both from their absolute need and importantly their faith, reach out to Jesus and healing happens. I love this story from Mark because it's actually two stories that are smashed together. How very interesting, how very unusual for the Gospel of Mark. In the midst of one healing that's in progress, another healing happens. In the midst of a very public asking for help and a crowd walking to the house to see what's going to happen, there is a very private healing that happens. A woman stretching out her hand to touch the edge of Jesus' robe. Here the woman is healed and declared full of faith to go and to live well. Her faith has made her well. Not that she had enough faith that she was able to be healed. This is not like quid pro quo. You got enough faith, you get healed. 
but that she had enough faith in Jesus that she was willing to take a risk and touch the edge of his robe, an act that actually could have gotten her stoned to death by the rules of the day. Now healed, she can rejoin her life, wherever that life may be, in her village or in her family. She would no longer be on the streets. Now Jarius, he takes a very different risk. He's wealthy, he has status. He'd lose a lot of face if this didn't work out. He might lose his job, which means he's risking the health and livelihood of his entire family and all the people who depend on him. And he's consorting with Jesus, who is stirring up a rabble. So that's not actually a very smart move either. Again, he has enough faith to risk it. And even when his daughter is pronounced dead and they tell Jesus not to bother, he still goes along with Jesus, who goes to the house. Because what if it doesn't work? And then they grieve the death and the fact that Jesus wasn't able to help and the risk was for nothing risk, risk of failure, risk of dying, risk of everything to find healing. But what we always need to remember when we think about Jesus' healing stories, Jesus always heals people back into community. It's never just an individual healing and that person continues on their way by themselves. Remember the 10 lepers who get healed and are told to go see the priest so they can be declared clean and rejoin the community. Now this woman is recognized by Jesus, both because he feels the power going out and wants to know what happened, but also he needs to find out who took the power so he can recognize them. He proclaims her well, and thus she is brought back to life, not just healed of her injury, but healed back into the community. She can be part of society again. He tells her to go live well, which doesn't mean, you know, go off and have that retirement in Florida. It means go and live well, live in the way that I, Jesus, am telling you to live, in community, caring for others. And you know, Jesus heals this daughter and the family into community too. In fact, what does he tell her once she gets up? What does he say? Go feed her, she's hungry. <laughs> now this would both prove that she's not a ghost or a demon or some otherworldly, you know, thing, because she's eating, She's a girl healed and alive and hungry, but also in breaking bread together, all the people who are there, remember they say all the people are bringing in casseroles. This was the most sacred act in first century times. In breaking bread together, she would be restored and healed back to her family and the community as a whole, back into the circle, back home. So these two people risk, and in turn, the community as a whole is healed. What are we willing to risk to ask Jesus for, for our community? Not for ourselves, just for ourselves, but for the whole. You see, often our American understanding of the world is we, risk, we lift up people who risk a lot and become entrepreneurs. They start companies, they get wealthy, they get power. We celebrate individualism and pulling oneself up by the bootstraps to get the American dream. Think Jeff Bezos or Steve Jobs or Elon Musk. Individualism celebrated. And what is all their wealth and power for? What do they do with it? They get more wealth and power. They risk, they get rewarded. But you know, the American dream is not the dream that Jesus lives or asks for us. We are called to risk for communities for our neighbors who need us here and out there. The whole and the good of all. You know, recently I've been thinking a lot about UCC First. So as the United Church of Christ, which we are a member of, we celebrate many firsts in our denomination or the denominations that merge together to become the United Church of Christ. And thinking about those firsts, I realized that even as we celebrate an individual who took a risk, it was in service to a greater whole, a community reward. Did you know that in 1700, the Reverend Samuel Sewell wrote the first anti-slavery abolitionist pamphlet? His was the first, but the goal was the freedom of enslaved black Americans. This was before America was even America, 1700. The risk? 
to him being ostracized, being tarred and feathered for being a traitor. The result? Minds changed, and slowly, yes, very, very slowly, the abolitionist movement grew and grew until finally slavery was abolished, in part because of this work. Did you know in 1817, UCC member Thomas Hopkins Gaudet co-founded the first school for the deaf? That's a UCC first. What was the risk? Well, what wasn't a risk? It's hard enough to start a school, but starting one for the deaf, who most people at the time believed were less than hearing folks? Why would someone do that? The risk, financial ruin, raising the hopes of a deaf community only to have them potentially lost? But what happened? It's a school that is to this day a light and a beacon, advocating for the rights of the deaf community, teaching sign to people resourcing deaf men, women, and children to go out and change the world. Risk, but for the community. How about 1959? Everett Parker owned a radio station. He was also the UCC communication ministry, part of that, and he challenged the southern radio stations that were blacking out Dr. King's addresses. They wouldn't let them on the radio. He took it to federal court and the airways were ruled public property, which means those addresses were no longer banned from the radio waves. What were the risks to him? The very real risk of arrest, violence, he'd received plenty of death threats, and the revoking of his radio station's license. What it meant? Part of the process of healing the community during the Civil Rights Movement. In 1972, William Johnson was ordained as the first openly gay pastor in any denomination in the UCC and challenged the almost universal notion at that time that LBGTQ folks were sinful and did not belong in the church and were going to hell. The difference that ordination made to the community still makes to the community, even as we're celebrating Pride Month this month, is huge. The change in how people see God and who belongs to the kingdom and the family of God. What do we risk? Not just what I risk for money or fame or power, but what do we risk to heal our community, our wider community? What do we risk in the way that Jesus can help us? How do we turn to Christ to risk who we are and how we are for the greater, the greater good and what Christ asks us to do walking around in the world? For together, we have the power and the privilege and the promise of bringing that change, that love, that inclusion, that incredible healing, not just one to one to one, but to the world rolling out through time. What do we dare? In Jesus' name, amen. I'm at all fully able to rise for our next hymn. Called Our Healer is on page 10. Thank you. 
We gather for a time of prayer to pray for healing for ourselves, our family, our neighbors, our community, and our wider world. For we trust in a Christ who meets us, hears our need, and gives us power through faith. So let us pray together. Jesus, you know our hearts. You know our very souls. You know where we hurt. You know where we long to be healed. You know our community. And you know what we can risk to heal that as well. Be with us both in this time of prayer and as we move out into a world that needs us. Help us to see you in the faces of our sisters and brothers, both those we know and those who are strangers. Help our hearts to be open to heal another, just as yours was open and the woman dared to touch your road. Remind us to lean on you when we fear the risk is too great, the costs are too high, the future is unknown, the reward is uncertain. For doing and trying and living in faith through you is all that you ask of us. We are blessed as we risk and we try not necessarily in how we succeed. We thank you for all the risks that we have taken where you have walked by our side, kept us company on a long, uncertain road, and let us know that you were there. Help us to be companions in faith to those in our lives who need to know of your presence and your healing touch. We pray for a community around us that is struggling, sometimes in ways we see and sometimes in ways we don't. For those who are hungry in our town, for those fearing eviction, for those struggling with isolation or depression or substance abuse. We pray for families who've lost loved ones, and families who need to be reconciled. We know your healing touch is possible. We pray for our nation with great grief with the people in Surfside, with great hope for how a community is rallied around them. We pray for our world that is constantly struggling and straining for places like Syria and Yemen, for Israel and the Palestinian state, for Venezuela and Brazil and India in particular impacted by COVID right now. May we be mindful that we are connected throughout the world through our faith and through our call to bring peace and justice and hope. We ask you to gather up all these prayers, O Christ, those spoken and those unspoken, as we pray together the prayer you taught the disciples, saying, Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to this morning's offering, which we participate in both before and after the service, to offer your gifts to the risk of being a church in this time and place, to the blessing that what you give of your money, your tithes, your time, your gifts, what that can do here, what that can be here, and how that can heal community within and beyond. So we will now celebrate and lift up to God today's offering. Generous God, over and over your grace sustains us, over and over your love provides for us, over and over your arms steadies us. We give you these gifts with gratitude and joy, thankful that you are God and we are yours. Amen. Our closing hymn is Forward to the Ages on pages 8 to 9. I invite all who are willing and able to rise.
so bound by one of God's far purpose into one living whole, we do move on together to that shining goal. And so may God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God look upon you with kindness and grant you peace this day and always. Amen.